Okay, we'll continue with the reading of Michel Foucault's The Archaeology of Knowledge and the Discourse on Language. Okay, from where we left off, we're trying to upload this video. I don't know if I'll have enough memory power to, to get it done. All right, we'll start off on page 22, and hopefully I'll be able to upload this video. Uh, this is where I left off in my last YouTube video, and we'll just continue from there. So, we must also question those divisions or groupings with which we have become so familiar. Can one accept as such the distinction between the major types of discourse, or that between such forms or genres as science, literature, philosophy, religion, history, fiction, etc., and which tend to create certain great historical individualities? We are not even sure of ourselves when we use these distinctions in our own world of discourse, let alone when we are analyzing groups of statements which, when first formulated, were distributed, divided, and characterized in a quite different way. After all, literature and politics are recent categories which can be applied to medieval culture or even classical culture. Only by a retrospective hypothesis and by an interplay of formal analogies or semantic resemblances but neither literature, nor politics, nor philosophy and the sciences articulated the field of discourse in the 17th or 18th century as they did in the 19th century. In any case, these divisions, whether our own or those contemporary with the discourse under examination, are always themselves reflexive categories, principles of classification, normative rules, institutionalized types. They are, in turn, are facts of discourse that deserve to be analyzed beside others, or, of course, they also have complex relations with each other, but they are not intrinsic and universally recognizable characteristics. Excuse me. But the unities that must be suspended above all are those that emerge in the most immediate way, those of the book and the oeuvre. At first sight, it would seem that one could not abandon these unities without extreme artificiality, and they are not given in the most definite way. There is the material individualization of the book, which occupies a determined space, which has an economic value, and which itself indicates by a number of signs the limits of its beginning and its end. And there is an establishment of an oeuvre which we recognize and we limit by attributing a certain number of texts to an author. And yet, as soon as one looks at the matter a little more closely, the difficulties begin. The material unity of the book. Is this the same in the case of an anthology of poems, a collection of posthumous fragments, de Sargis Traité de Comique, or the volume of Michelet's Histoire de France? Is it the same in the case of Mallarmé's Un Coup de Day, The Trial of Gilles de Ray, Boutour's San Marco, or of a Catholic Missal? In other words, okay, in other words, is it not the material unity of the volume and weak accessory unity in relation to the discursive unity of which it is the support? But is this discursive unity itself homogeneous and uniformly applicable? A novel by Stendhal and a novel by Dostoevsky do not have the same relation of individuality as that between two novels belonging to Balzac's cycle, La Comédie Humaine. And the relation between Balzac's novels is not the same as the existing between Joyce's Ulysses and Odyssey. The frontiers of a book are never clear-cut, beyond the title, the first lines, and the last full stop. Beyond its internal configuration and its autonomous form, it is caught up in a system of references to other books, other texts, other sentences. It is a node within a network, and this network of references is not the same in the case of a mathematical treatise, a textual commentary, a historical account, and an episode in a novel cycle. The unity of the book, even in the sense of a group of relations, cannot be regarded as identical in each case. The book is not simply the object that one holds in one's hands, and it cannot remain within the little parallel pipe that contains it. Its unity is variable and relative. 
as soon as one questions that unity, it loses its self-evidence. It indicates itself, constructs itself, only on the basis of a complex field of discourse.